welcome everybody to the session today. Uh, so this session today is part of a three uh, series webinar, and we'll be just covering over today a number of different elements of the cloud capabilities as a whole. So what we want to get started on today is the, the, the key topic. So you know, what does the cloud give you in terms of reducing your IT complexity? You know, lots of people come from estates where you have lots of legacy, many, many systems, huge integration complexities, differences in software providers, my service providers. So how does the cloud help you out in that manner? Moving on from that then, what does it mean to you as an organization? How you as an organization can change in terms of making yourselves more efficient by reorganizing your business to use the cloud and getting those efficiencies from the cloud use. How does that then improve your scalability? You know, lots of companies are growing, you need to move up, and it's a very difficult world sometimes to get hold of hardware, install it in data centers. How does the cloud help out in those areas? Where then does the cloud drive us forwards? How do we help uh, with the cloud capabilities in moving businesses into the future and utilizing all of the growth areas, you know, terms like Gen AI come to mind, which is obviously a very popular topic at this time. How does the cloud give us the abilities around security, compliance, regulatory needs? And a lot of those are very difficult sometimes in your own organization when you're building that internally. Uh, how do we get that from the cloud in pre-packaged capabilities? And going forward, you know, everybody wants to do things cheaper, faster, in a more efficient manner. So where does the cloud come into play there? So I think you know, the first place to start is there is no cloud. It is just someone else's computer. You are normally renting a computer from a company, be that Amazon, Microsoft, Google, Oracle. There are many providers out there. And there are many types of cloud. You have the public cloud, which is you know Amazon. I could go onto the Amazon public cloud now and create myself a virtual machine, a storage solution, a large language model. And I can do that in the public cloud and I can rent that capability. You can have a private cloud, again, utilizing an Amazon or Google, but buying a part of their cloud, very specifically owning capabilities, compute servers, storage in that cloud, which is dedicated to yourself. And then the hybrid model, which is a mixture of both. And also you could add on top of that, where in some cases, you have business crucial information that you don't want to share in any form of cloud. You want to keep that in your own data center. So there's a number of different areas and models uh, for us to work on. But the cloud is there. It's, it's a term we use. It is really about where you utilize a data center, which is normally not sort of sitting in your business, in your building. And when I was going through the sort of preparation for this. Uh, you know, my marketing team, very kind to actually call me a veteran. I think it was being kind anyway, calling me a veteran uh, in the context of uh, preparing for the uh, the sort of introduction to this uh, uh, presentation set. And I was looking back and actually started thinking back about my career. And, you know, I am 53 years old now. I started in IT on ICL mainframes back in 1989. And the ACL mainframe I was using then was called an ACL VME 3900. And this is just a picture of that mainframe reconstructed at the National Museum of Computers in Bletchley Park uh, in the UK. And VME stands for Virtual Machine Environment. So even when I started my career back in 1989, I was working in the cloud as this computer was based in Eastcourt which is a, a little a town north of London, where I was based in South Wales. So I was using a computer which was a couple of hundred miles away from my location in a cloud. You know, we used to call that a mainframe, but that's what it is. It was still cloud computing. And the virtual machine environment allowed me to create storage. It allowed me to create compute capabilities, be that for a production service, a test service, a development service in an ICL VME environment. So we talk about cloud now as it being a modern technology, but in many ways it's not. Cloud goes back to your mainframe, to the virtual machine environments. And I know we moved away from those. We moved because the power of the desktop computer became so powerful that the servers underneath your desk or server you can have in your office became more powerful than the mainframe. But now the model has changed again and we are going back into this model of remote compute, cloud compute. 
But if anybody ever wants to see these computers, it was a wonderful trip up to Bletchley Park. And uh, obviously there's the Alan Turin element there as well from World War II. So why is the cloud becoming more important for us? You know, some of the, the data, the throughput, the volumetrics, the number of users we have is increasing at a vast rate. You look at YouTube, you know, these are just some statistics I picked up on YouTube. You know, they're processing 100 petabytes of data per day. <laughs> yeah, 100,000 terabytes or a million, 100 million gigabytes. That's a phenomenal amount of data. Even in the world we live in now where our computers on our desks have one, two, three terabytes of data, that is still a huge amount of data. And if I just flick back to this picture, these boxes you can see at the front, 44, 45, those are tape drives. If my memory serves me correctly, they used to hold 500 megabytes of data on one, on one tape. So you, know, you see the difference now in the world we live in and the amount of data that is being throughputted on YouTube. Likewise with Netflix, you know, they're storing vast amounts of films, TV series up in the cloud. We don't know where those computers are. They spread all around the world, Europe, Asia, uh, the USA, South America, they're stored all around the world. But when we want to watch a TV program, we log on to our Netflix app, we log on to our Netflix on the TV, and we stream that data down. And that is coming from this nebulous thing called the cloud. You don't know where it's coming from. It could come from the USA when you're based in the UK. It could come from Australia when you're based in India. But the cloud is providing these capabilities for us. And the resilience of the cloud, the ability for us to have many instances of the same compute capability and storage capability gives the ability to, for companies such as Netflix, not to have downtime. They have huge resilience. I, you know, I honestly can't remember the last time I went onto Netflix and for a problem to be on the Netflix side where they couldn't stream the, the films to me. And if anybody wants to look into how Netflix do that, I just have a search for something called Chaos Monkey, where Netflix actually runs an application on their servers which goes around crashing servers randomly all around the network in their production environment. This is how brave they are. They run this in their production environment to ensure that their environment, their resilience is strong enough to cope with any non-directly uh, driven outages from themselves. And again, you know, one of the prime movers, obviously, and one of the, the, the areas that you'll all know about if you're looking at cloud computing is Amazon. You know, probably the biggest supplier of cloud compute to the market at this point in time. You know, they started and they had to have a huge amount of compute to cope with Black Friday, Cyber Monday, Christmas, special days in the year when they do sales. So they had all of this compute created and they had to scale it as a lot of us as companies do to a level where we have to cope with the maximum throughput during a day. But that maximum throughput is not the base throughput. That's not the average throughput. You know, the vast majority of companies will probably be running at 20% of their compute power. The extra 80% is only required for those days where, as a retailer, you might have a sale on and you're driving transactions. As a, a mobile phone company, your uh, compute power might be required more when a Apple releases the latest iPhone or Samsung releases the latest Galaxy phone. But we have, as solution providers, to have that capability there to support huge amounts of throughput when we need it. But that, that compute power then is dead for a lot of the other time during the day. And again, this is where the model that Amazon, Azure, uh, Google and all put in place now to allow us to scale our compute, to scale our storage, to scale our bandwidth, to cope with those days where the pressure comes on. And the benefits, of course, of that is we don't pay for that compute, that storage when we're not using it, and we scale back to our 20% level uh, as we need it. So to reflect back on some of the different types of cloud computing, uh, these are probably terms that you are familiar with, you'll see on websites on a daily basis, but just as a, a refresher for, for people, uh, we start at the bottom with infrastructure as a service. So that is where you request from a cloud provider, in you know, my terms, I would call it TIN, you're asking for a server, you're asking for a storage. It's not giving you any real functionality, it's not giving you any software, it's just giving you that bare server, that bare capability uh, to store or use compute. There's no operating system there. It's the very basics. 
And that is great for when you have very capable teams who want very specific needs to configure servers and storage as they so wish. Moving up from that, then you have platform as a service. So from that, you get in more of a rounded operating system. You get in more of a package solution. With that, quite often, that would be where you want to create a platform. Your development teams might want to use a, a platform, or you might come in and you want a, a database. So you want an Oracle database, or you want a, a SQL Server database, and that is your platform as a service. So that's pre-packaged uh, in an environment that you can use with an amount of capabilities. And then building on top of that, you then have software as a service. So here you have the likes of Salesforce as a prime example of a software as a service provider. You are getting the full package. They are handling all of your storage, all of your capacity. They're scaling up and scaling down as you go. You don't care in this context about what and how your company is working. You are using Salesforce and it's their responsibility to scale to your needs. It might be in the morning, you only have 100 users on your Salesforce CRM. And then lunchtime, you have 5,000 users on your CRM. You don't have to do any of that provisioning of compute power, storage power, bandwidth, Salesforce, or the software as a service provider will take ownership of that for you. Of course, all of these have got different pricing models. You start at the bottom, you get the cheapest price, you move it up the, 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 the pyramid, and you get to have to pay more money for each of these services that are being provided. On the top of the pyramid then is the value adds. What else comes on top? Uh, again, just to use Salesforce as an example, Salesforce operate the app exchange where they provide additional companies to provide you services and other capabilities. You also have you know, Gen AI capabilities which sit in on top of other service providers. So there's many providers out there now which are giving you their base software as a service and then you can buy third party add-ons. One of the anal anal analogies I used to use for this model was, it's like a pizza. Your pizza is your level. When you've got a pizza, which is your standard sort of margarita pizza, for, on top of that, then you start putting toppings in place. You start putting your pepperoni, your onions, your mushrooms. That is the additional uh, aspect you get when you go from the software as a service to enhancing those capabilities. Moving forwards then from there, you know, why is this still important? You know, cloud's been around now for a few years. You know, the buzzword of a cloud probably started back in 2015, 2016, when everybody started moving to the cloud and the conferences around the world were all talking about this thing called the cloud that we should all use. And you think, oh, in many ways, the cloud's gone now. The cloud's finished. You know, we're, we're all doing it. But that's not the case. There's still a lot of companies who are yet to get onto the cloud. There's still lots of companies who are looking to move to increase the use of the cloud. Who are who have started maybe make it? They've moved ten percent on. They're looking to move the rest now. They they have the confidence. And I think it did take a while for companies, telecommunications companies, financial services companies, to adapt to for government re regulation in some cases to allow for the use of this thing called the cloud. So if you look at the, the graphs there, and this was uh, information you know, we picked up when we were doing the research for this uh, webinar, was the growth is still phenomenal we are seeing a huge growth in all forms of the platforms from your SaaS, your PaaS, and your IaaS to actually see that growth continuing through uh, the years. This is grown by the traditional companies who are moving more and more capabilities into the cloud. Uh, you know, the data center leases are coming up, the traditional software licenses that they had are coming up for renewal, and that gives them the opportunity to move on. So there's still a huge market of growth in the cloud providers. There's still a huge amount of opportunity for companies to create SaaS offerings, PaaS offerings, and also for the new capabilities to come into the cloud, such as generative AI, machine learning, uh, IoT devices, which are all being put into the cloud, which again is causing more companies to actually move to the cloud to get use of these capabilities. So you know, if we look at it from a, a growth rate, it's, it's phenomenal. Uh, you know, this is why Jeff Bezos has just you know, built himself another huge yacht, the biggest yacht in the world he still have, has, you know, Larry Ellison has still got a couple of islands. There's these companies who are making phenomenal growth in the uh, market of providing services. And yes, we are paying for them, we, we're giving them nice yachts, but it's giving us benefits as well as software and solution providers. We are able to take benefits of these capabilities. We're able to trial ideas 
in the cloud. We're able, you know, I could go on now and I do this on a regular basis for my sort of own personal work. I go on to the cloud and I create a server. I create a website. I create a VPN. I create all of these things myself in the cloud. And I can do that in a matter of minutes using some of the tools and capabilities in the cloud. And then when I finish playing with it, I get rid of it. So I've had this huge, powerful server that I, you know, I didn't have to pay a thousand pounds for a license for. I've had this huge, powerful um, generative AI, ma AI model that I haven't had to pay a thousand pounds for. I just run it for an hour and it might've cost me two pounds 50 or $2.50 or whatever it may be, depending on the part of the world you're in. So the ability to use this and test to use it is, is superb, uh, but the growth continues. And I say, as I've said on the previous slide, that companies are more, um, I suppose, a bit able to move onto the cloud. Now, some of the regulatory barriers have been brought back down, and some of the compliance that the cloud uh, providers have given it gives more opportunities for companies to move to the cloud. And the ability to scale, you know, we talked about this earlier, and you know, we've got the ability to horizontally scale, to vertically scale, get more storage, to get more compute power. Uh, to trial ideas. Uh, you know, who, some companies, you know, they have markets where they just trial ideas because they, they don't now have to wait nine months for a server to arrive on site. They can provision a server, trial I an idea for a month, invest maybe you know, a couple of thousand pounds, maybe a hundred thousand pounds on trial an idea. If it doesn't work, they can get rid of it. They haven't committed to five, 10 years worth of infrastructure and software licensing. So as a company, what benefits also does you know, moving to the cloud give you? Well, again, you know, I can go back to my early days and, and there might be a number of people on this call who used to go into a data center. Uh, you know, quite often in some of the buildings I used to work in, within that building, there was a data center. You had to have a special pass. It would be an, an air conditioned room. It had three lines of different electricity coming in there for, for security and backup. You had then that data center replicated in another building, maybe a couple of miles away or a couple of hundred miles away for your disaster recovery. You had power, you had engineers. When you wanted to upgrade, you then went to Intel or Oracle and asked for a new server. And that took maybe a couple of months and you had to get um, a moving company in to actually install that into your office. You know, with the cloud, you get away from that. You don't have to have that complexity. You don't have to run your own data center. You don't have to deal with electricity boards. You don't have to deal with air conditioning manufacturing companies. You are reducing the complexity of your organization. You are giving that to a specialist who's going to do it all for you. You, you democratize in the ability of your company to work with other organizations who are more specialist in these areas rather than having a huge department to run it yourself. That means that those staff that you have in your organization, which used to run the data center, which used to run your IT, you can utilize them internally and they can focus them more on business value tasks. Running of the data center was crucial to our businesses many years ago, but now it shouldn't be crucial to the business. The crucial part of the business is giving value to the customer of delivering capabilities to the customer of reducing our cost to serve. So all of this comes with the benefits of moving to the cloud. It will free up capabilities within your organization to focus on what is key to your business and not what is just a, a domestic task to, to run your organization. And you know, I've mentioned it a few times now, and it, it just keeps repeating in my brain whenever I, I do work on the cloud is scale. Quite often, we don't know what scale we're running at. We don't know what scale we'll need, what the new iPhone, what the new widget from Amazon will do, what the new television from Sony will do. If we are selling this capability, when we these things come to market, if we are a company that is selling that capability, we have to react very quickly. And the cloud gives us that ability to flex uh, with the marketplace without having to have all of that hardware, software uh, pre-provisioned for us. Leading on from that then, we, we have to think about how we restructure our organizations. What do we do with those teams? How do we bring them together? How do we start working? Well, we have to have some form of IT cloud capability. A moment ago, I was mentioning the fact that we don't have to have a data center team, but we do need to have a cloud team. 
So some of those staff will be reprovisioned into maybe a cloud center of excellence. You can bring that in, you can bring in a managed service provider. There are many managed service providers who will do that for you, but some companies like to keep that internally and create their own center of excellence. So there's opportunities there for staff retraining, uh, staff uh, moving forward uh, into their careers with doing the right thing and using their capabilities in a very effective manner. There are new skills, and you know, if you are looking at Amazon or Google or Microsoft, there's the base certifications there. You know, I've, uh, a couple of years ago, I did certifications in the Amazon and Microsoft arena uh, for myself, uh, for my personal development. So you, you'll need to retrain your staff, they'll have to get experience, and each of the service providers will have different capabilities that they provide. The base technology is the same. It's compute, it's storage, it's bandwidth, it's throttling, it's API gateways, but what they do and how they do it is different. So you'll need to work out what cloud providers you are using and then what your center of excellence needs to develop in terms of a skill set. And having that skill set uh, you know, is important because those will be the ones who will ensure then that your cloud runs to the most efficient manner that you want it for, uh, for your organization. Um, and when I was go going through this presentation and trying to you know, bring to life some of this, you know, we were looking for case studies. And this is not a case study that you know, Tory Harris have done ourselves. We have done some cloud for us, you know, a very large US retailer. And like a lot of la large retailers within the US market, they had a legacy infrastructure base. They had data centers all around the US that they were maintaining. And going back to my points earlier, they were having to work with different electricity providers for the different states, different providers of air conditioning units. They had a hugely complex infrastructure of getting data and resilience and disaster recovery across their estate of legacy systems. When they wanted to, to grow, if they wanted to improve their online platforms, if they wanted to do more direct to the customer selling, uh, like uh, shopping to the door, they then had to buy in hardware and software from providers. And that was starting to take them a long time to do that growth. They were having to think six, nine, 12 months ahead to get that hardware provision and delivered to their data centers uh, to be installed. So they started to move to a cloud approach. They looked at how they started moving some of the customer facing tools, the data sets, the websites, uh, some of the CRM capabilities up into the cloud to give them the first start. That was where they started using the public cloud, where they could actually share compute power. They were paying for scalability. They weren't um, buying a set amount of capability for a specific set of time. They were using that scalability that the cloud, the public cloud gave them. But for more business crucial data, they were keeping that internally. So you know, PII data comes to mind here. So publicly, uh, privately identifiable, identifiable information uh, on that on customers which they did not want to share to in any public cloud environment they kept internally to themselves so again this is a model that a lot of companies you see using where they want to keep specific sensitive data internally on a data center or a private cloud and then other capabilities which are not so uh, sensitive they those are the ones which are being put out to the public cloud so you know, the, the retailers seen you know huge advantages here you know the, the cost savings uh, that they've made from having this flexible model. They don't have to run the data centers. They don't have to provide all this electricity and all of the other elements that go with that. Uh, they've taken long-term contracts out with the, the cloud suppliers to fix their cost base over the years. They can now scale for their sale events for the Black Fridays and Cyber Mondays and the Christmases and other specific events in the US where they are trying to uh, get benefits from scale and uh, expand their organization. Uh, they're able to use new technologies. They are looking into machine learning, uh, how they do next best action or next best offer for the customer. Uh, when you know, all of us were probably familiar, this isn't Amazon, but you know, this uh, they work in a similar model to Amazon in that you know, if you buy something, it will give you a, an offer or they will give you a product that someone else like you has bought. So they're able to use some of these machine learning uh, techniques to, to build on that. The data is more secure because they have this ability now to use the cloud and the resilience of the cloud. You know, if you look at you know, the cloud providers, the cloud providers work on a regional basis or in the US, they might have uh, 10 regions uh, of data centers and each of those regions will have 
uh, availability zones. An availability zone will be a segmented data center. So you have all of this resilience built in from the outset into the cloud, which gives you the ability, if you put a bit, piece of data into the cloud, it is replicated across certain parts of the cloud, which gives you a high resilience. And if you are running a website or a database, again, you may have some of your database running in the east coast of the USA, some in the west coast of the USA, and some in Europe. And that gives you that worldwide resilience, should there be any issues in any part of the um, the cloud, that you can always have a resilient and reliable uh, disaster recovery approach. And the retailer as well was concerned about GDPR and data, and they worked with the, uh, the supplier to ensure that all of the capabilities that they were buying uh, and using from the supplier conform to GDPR regulations and other uh, regulations that were reliant uh, on in the US. And you're going to take a drink. I, I am recovering from a bit of a cold. I was out in a, a conference last week and I was uh, unfortunate enough to pick up a cold last week, which I'm still uh, suffering from. So I'll just take a quick drink of water. Thank you. Uh, so let's come back to scalability now. So, you know, the biggest, for me, the, this is the biggest advantage of the cloud is the ability to scale. Uh, so, yes, I was talking about scalability, and for me, this is one of the biggest uh, advantages of, of the cloud. It's one of the things I love about the cloud is that it, it means that companies such as Uber and Jesseet and a lot of the entrepreneur companies, which I don't think would ever have started without cloud computing, because they were able to start without commitment to a data center. They were able to start without paying Oracle £5,000 for a, a lot of Oracle server licenses or Microsoft for SQL server licenses. They were able to do all of this in a very efficient manner with building something in the cloud, testing it, iterating it. And as it became successful, they were able to expand and grow with the, the customer base they were building. I, mean, I think you know, this, for me, was one of the magic parts of, of the cloud that we've had over the last couple of years. There are companies now challenge us, and it's a risk as all, also for a lot of the big organizations who are already in place, that Without that agility of scalability in the cloud, you can't move forward very, very quickly. And you know, we've seen it in numerous cases where a lot of these new companies have come along and grown very quickly. They've been able to scale. They haven't had to wait for nine months or 12 months for a server to arrive. They haven't had to wait for huge procurement contracts to be put in place to get software licenses. They've been able to react. Excuse me. They've been able to buy, again, I'll just use the example of Salesforce, a Salesforce license very, very quickly and get up and run in, in that, or there'd be monday.com or workday.com. All of these capabilities have been able to be delivered to them very, very quickly. And that is one of the benefits that the cloud has given. It just allows you that growth capability. And you know, if you go from one customer today to any, whatever product you sell becomes viral and you want 10,000, you have 10,000 customers tomorrow, you can scale to that very, very quickly in the cloud. You can move forward, you can react. Uh, which you know, I don't think we could do uh, very well in previous years. And likewise, you know, if you do the investment and your company isn't successful, then all of a sudden you close it down. You know, I, I can go to AWS now and the servers I have running, I had closed down and in 10 minutes and that is my cost stopped. I don't have any more expense after I bought it. Whereas again, in the legacy days, I would have that server sitting in my house. I'd probably put it onto eBay and try and sell it along with the, the software licenses. And we look at the flexibility, this is all building on the same theme and the same topic. You can use what capability you need at the right time. You can use software as a service if that's what you want. You can use platform as a service if you want a database or a website. You can use infrastructure as a service if you want storage or bare machines. You have lots of capabilities in there. And every time I log on to Amazon or Microsoft or Google onto their, uh, their cloud consoles, I see new capabilities. You'll see things like IoT. You'll see things like gaming. You'll see things like edge compute. You know, in the most recent world, we have all of these new generative AI, machine learning, artificial intelligence capabilities coming along. And again, I can test those. I can go on, I can utilize them. It gives me that flexibility of trying the latest and greatest software and capabilities without purchasing the licenses, without purchasing the servers. And that's what gives us the ability to react as 
you know, suppliers of software, suppliers of services to customers, quite often we have to react to the market because our competitors are doing it. So if we have a great cloud service provider, if we have internally a great cloud center of excellence, if we have that capability, a project team can be spun up very, very quickly to look at a new capability, investigate it, as I said, and work in an entrepreneurial manner internally to the company and spin up a new capability and see how it works. If it works, great, we'll deploy it further. If it doesn't work, crush it down and get away from it. But move on. You can really iterate and you can test and you move your companies forward at a rapid rate by using the power of the cloud. And you know, things like edge computing, I put this on here specifically because cloud computing, people think, you know, yes, we have these big data centers. And yes, you do it. You have a big data center, but also you have the ability to have the compute out at what is called the edge. So let's say you have a data center in London and you have a data center in Edinburgh. So I'm just referring to the UK, but you know, this applies to anywhere in the world. There is a latency for me in the West country, the West of England, to connect into Edinburgh or to connect into London. To remove some of that latency, the, the cloud providers now are moving compute power from the big data centers out further into what's called the edge. So there might be, for me, I live close to a city called Bath in the West of England, there may be an edge compute capability in Bath. So I'm utilizing that capability as well as the large scale compute capability within the London data center. So it is moving cloud capability out further uh, to give lower latency. And in tools and technologies such as IoT or you know, in the world of gaming as a service, which is another one of the big capabilities coming on, that edge compute is becoming much more important because the latency or the low latency aspect of having edge compute improves the throughput, improves the, um, the data transfer rates uh, when you're dealing with this uh, capability on the edge. And IoT devices, again, is a prime example here where you have factories, uh, like maybe a BMW factory, which is running a lot of IoT devices, and they need that compute very close to the factory to allow them to process the results, the data created by the IoT devices, which is then shared back to the, the large data centers and the large servers uh, in the regions and the availability zones. So where we move into now with, with the cloud, uh, there's lots of growth still in the cloud. There's lots of areas because of what it is, all of the new terms or the new technologies are coming first to the cloud. And that's where people, again, are able to try them and see if they work. So you know, we've, <laughs> we've talked earlier about artificial intelligence intelligence and machine learning. You know, we can now create large language models in the cloud. Uh, I, if I remember the term correctly, there's Amazon Bedrock, which is the ability to create your own la large language model in the cloud to allow me to do uh, AI and machine learning. There's lots of capabilities being delivered by all of the providers. Google have just launched Vertex and Duo at Duet, uh, that are they are new AI capabilities as well. All of that is being launched through the cloud. You look at Microsoft and the open AI work they are doing, chat GPT, all being run in the cloud. So all of these compute capabilities, AI and ML, are being driven by uh, the cloud. We, as end users, we don't see that cloud. All we see is if you go to chat GPT or Bing chat, we see a chat box, we type something in, and it gives us a result. Well, that is using vast quantities of compute, vast quantities of data, which is stored all around the world and is being created as part of the large language models when things like chat GPT has been trained. I mentioned about IoT a moment ago. The world is moving to connected cars, connected fridges. You know, <laughs> in the UK, we used to have a program called Tomorrow's World, which talked about the connected world, but it's becoming more of reality. You look at Tesla, the connected car. You look at Volvo and the Pulse, um, I was going to say Pulsar brand, but I may have got that wrong, but all of these cars and technologies are now becoming more and more connected. The, the, the capabilities around uh, self-drive, all this will be driven by IoT devices, which are based in uh, the, the cars themselves. I won't say the word because I, many of you may have these devices behind you, but there's a, you know, Amazon provide a, a tool where you say a name and that provides you with instant responses. That again is based on IoT, and the cloud. When you request the song or the answer or the mathematical question to the, the device, 
it goes to the cloud. It, it runs in what's called a service, serverless model in that it gets some compute to answer your question and then gets rid of that compute. But that is the cloud and IoT devices at work. Digital twins is an, a, a concept which is growing at a, a vast rate, you know, builds on top of things like AI and ML and IoT. The digital twins concept is around modeling things from the real world in the cloud and allowing the cloud then to do the analysis of that. You know, some of the areas I look at here are uh, fluid dynamics. So if we look at Formula One cars as an example here, a Formula One car has you know, a, an aerodynamic profile. They've created a digital twin of that Formula One car in the cloud, and they run in fluid dynamic algorithms on the top of that um, digital twin to see how that car performs. So rather than now than having to create a, a lot of carbon fiber parts, carbon fiber pieces, put them on the car and do the testing in the physical world, they model that in the digital twin and do the testing. They then do a conformance when they bring it to the racetrack to make sure what they're seeing in the, the digital twin is conforming to what is being delivered on the racetrack. But you're getting that interaction and the modeling gets better um, results when it gets the feedback loop from what happens in the physical world. So digital twinning is something which is happening a lot now and, and lots of companies in the physical world are looking to how they, they move their physical products uh, and model them as digital twins. Yeah. Aeroplanes being another prime example there of, you know, they are being created now on a computer. They're being uh, dynamically tested, aerodynamically tested, weight tested, uh, stress tested as a digital twin before they're created and the test pilot gets in the cockpit to take it up into the air. Another big area of uh, use of the cloud and innovation is in the data streaming. We have, you know, as mentioned earlier, we have Netflix streaming data, we have YouTube streaming data, we have gaming services. If any of you are gamers or have children who are gamers, you know, we are now seeing NVIDIA broadcasting games. So I don't have to have a large computer in my house anymore. I don't have to pay a couple of thousand pounds for the latest CPU or graphics card. I can get that from the cloud. So I log on to play the latest Call of Duty, or um, what was the one which came out last week, Starfield. I don't have to have that again locally. I log on to Microsoft or I log on to NVIDIA and I can get access to that game at a very high resolution through my the TV in my room. So all of that capability is coming through streaming and the performance of the cloud. So when I log on to play Call of Duty online, somewhere in the world, somewhere on a data center in the cloud, a computer is created for Mark Thomas. That game is loaded onto that computer for me. And I play that game. And that game could be hosted in Florida or Chile or Melbourne or Bangalore. I don't know. And I don't care. As long as I've got the game in front of me that I can play, it doesn't matter to me anymore where that game uh, server is hosted. And that, again, is the throughput, the provision of the cloud that you can go from 10 people running a game to 10,000 people running the game, and this cloud, the capabilities that they put in place will scale with you. Uh, moving a bit further onwards now, so you know, always on the back of people's mind when you're running compute or you're delivering projects or programs of work is security and compliance. It's the bedrock of a lot of the requirements. Any requirements documents that I've received over the years, there's been a section on security and compliance. Is the data encrypted? How is it encrypted? How are people accessing the data? Is it secure? What, when the data is changed, uh, is that all being logged? And can I see who's changing it, who's viewing it? Uh, how do I stop people from getting at my data uh, from bad actors in the world? And am I compliant with the, the rules and regulations that my country, my business, my sector requires of me? And the cloud providers, I've jumped all over this, they are now ensuring that you, know, you have the ability to encrypt your data to the highest possible levels uh, when it's in the cloud. Uh, you have identity and access management, so you know who, what, when people saw things or did things with your data. You have the ability to roll back. You have that security of reporting and knowing and locking down systems, working on a least access privilege model that you only get to see what you need, not everything, and work backwards from there. Uh, so anything you do on the cloud, should you set it up this way? Obviously, it's on us as people to, when we create the cloud, to set it up correctly. 
you build in that login and monitoring. The capabilities are there. It's up to us to utilize that login and monitoring capability and get the correct report in out of it. And we've all been scared for a long while that you know, when we've run our own data centers, the threat of bad actors, the threat of denial of service attacks, the, the threat of slow law risk attacks, all of these elements where we would be in attack constantly and we were having to ourselves patch our servers, we were having to put in more API gateways, we had to put more capabilities in to protect ourselves more and more from the bad actors. The cloud providers are, are doing that for us. They are seeing the bad actors. They're able to block the bad actors across a spectrum of companies. So if you are, I use uh, Netflix and also you are Starbucks, then if Netflix are, are having an attack, the host of Netflix, well, maybe it's Amazon, and we're also hosting Starbucks, we'll go, okay, we've seen that happen to Netflix. We will apply the rules, the restrictions for this denial of service because we know Starbucks will be the next attack vector. So we'll, we'll, we'll lock it all down. So we're getting that protection capability across the board that we are not having to react to. We're not having to patch and build servers. The, the cloud providers are doing that for us. And the compliance, you know, we, you know, we talked earlier about PII data. You've got things like HIPAA, uh, GDPR, all of these are being built for regulatory uh, uh, needs and regulatory requirements from around the world. And most industries now will have a set of requirements and you will go to your cloud provider and they will have a package of compliancy that they will be able to give to you when you host. So that when you are then reporting to you uh, Ofcom or Ofgem or whatever your regulatory body is, you will be able to say, I am hosting on Microsoft Azure and Microsoft Azure guarantees me this compliance from the servers and solutions I am using. But what does this mean for us? At the end of the day, we want to be more efficient. And more efficient most of the time is how much money is this saving for me? Because it might be more efficient in staff costs, might be more efficient in product delivery, might be more efficient in time to market. Most of that actually comes back to mandatory outcomes. So you know, how do you get more money back from delivering on the, on the, the cloud? Excuse me. It, well, we mentioned earlier, reducing the upfront costs. You can test things, you can do things that you would not normally be able to do without buying hardware and software very, very quickly. So you're reducing your innovation costs. You're only paying as you, as you go. You, you know, the usage model, you pay for what you use, and when you're not using it, you're not paying for it. So you're reducing your costs there. You're not having to buy the 100% capability and capacity that we used to have to buy. Because you're doing it on a large scale, you are benefiting from Amazon buying the servers or Microsoft buying the servers or Google buying the servers. They buy those servers from Intel and Oracle and others for a reduced price. You know, they've got better deals with Nvidia and AMD for chip prices. So they are getting that hardware maybe at 50% of what you as an end customer would have to pay for that hardware. So you benefit in the longer term of that. You can share resources, you can share data. There's lots of useful data sets and information in the cloud that you can use, that again, you're not having to pay for or host yourself. And you can build capabilities and tools for provisioning hardware and servers in a, a software language. So when you need a new server, when you need new capabilities, rather than physically having to do it, you, you write a script and you can run that script one to a hundred times. So it becomes easier, the repetition part becomes less cumbersome and it becomes more efficient there. In the long term, that may reduce your IT staff. Obviously, we may redeploy those and create a cloud center of excellence, but there's a reduction maybe in IT staff in the running of the IT, and that means that those can be redeployed to get more use out of business value. And again, one of the areas, uh, yeah, when I go back to that uh, picture I showed you earlier about the ICL VME mainframe, when I created that mainframe back, I say I created, when I used that ICL mainframe back in 1989, we had two data centers. We had Eastcourt VME5 and Eastcourt VME4, and they were separated by about half a mile on an old RAF base at Eastcourt in North London. And the reason they were separated by half a mile was the thought was if anything happened to one of the data centers, the other data center wouldn't be affected, the gap was big enough. Now, with the disaster recovery capabilities of the cloud, you don't just have resilience over a couple of miles, maybe in a region. You have a number of regions within a country, and then you have regions spread over the world. I don't know what the figures are now, but each of the cloud suppliers probably has 20, 30, 40, 50 
regions around the world, and each of those regions has multiple data centers. So your resilience, your disaster recovery capabilities are vast. You have to build it correctly. And the other thing, you can build now pilot-like systems. Uh, if anybody's familiar with the term, that you may, in, again, you know, looking back to when I was doing disaster recovery in the server days, I had to have one server site, which was 100% of my capacity needs. And I used to have another data center, which was 60% of my capacity needs. Because so I couldn't afford to run it to it 100%, but I had to have some data center there to cope with a failover should my one data center fail. Now I can run a one cloud data center, one cloud set of serves and capabilities at 100% and scale that up and down as I need it. Should that fail for any reason, I have what is called a pilot light, which is a very minuscule, maybe 1% server set running, and that's running all the time. And as soon as the main site fails and people fail over, that 1%, because of the scalability capabilities of the cloud and flexibility of the cloud grows from 1% to 100% in a matter of, I'll say minutes, it's more likely to depend on the scale of your organization, it could be minutes up to hours, but that capability to, to fail over to do disaster recovery uh, is amazing uh, in the cloud capability. And you know we touched on innovation a little earlier. So that's where I'm gonna stop. Uh, I think I've talked now for about 50 minutes, so I'm gonna have a little drink. Uh, So we do have two further webinars planned. Uh, the, the next webinar is planned for a month's time at the end of October 26, where I'll be in a conversation with one of my car colleagues called Carthic. And Carthic is a highly experienced person who runs our center of excellence over in Bangalore for Tory Harris. And we're gonna discuss there some of the use cases uh, that we've done ourselves in moving customers to the cloud, some of the challenges, some of the, uh, the intrigues, some of the outcomes that we've achieved helping our customers, and some of the best practices that we've built at Tory Harris over the years, some of the accelerators we've built to help companies move from their on-site to hybrid, private, public cloud environments. So that is going to be running on October the 26th. And then we're going to run another session at the end of November, and there we'll be further delving into where cloud computing is going, talking more about things like generative AI, large language models. I'm going to do a bit, bit more of a deep dive into some of those innovative areas, uh, and that'll be further described as we get closer to that date. 